We're so glad you're here and glad you made it through the week. I'll just share one little bit about our story. We had one water pipe burst over the garage. No big deal. I had to shut off the water. We were very fortunate. We had a plumber, young man, showed up 5.30. I knew he'd been working all day long, and I thought this would be funny. I opened the door, I look at him and say, hey, man, you've just been waiting around all day at home hoping somebody might call and give you a little work? And he says, actually, I've kind of been busy today. I was like, (laughs) okay, just let's go to the garage. I'm not going to tease anymore. But he was a great young man, got us fixed up. I hope you're doing well or getting there anyhow. So this may sound strange, but every night I go to sleep with the TV on. And it's always to something that I have pre-recorded just for the purpose of helping me to relax and drift off. It's always an episode of 2020 Dateline or 48 Hours. Now, why it is that a show that's always about some horrific crime helps me relax and go to sleep I don't know, but it does, and it has for years. And the very best episodes are always narrated by this guy on your screen, Keith, my man, Morrison. Love this guy. I mean, there is Jesus, there's Peggy, there's Stephen and Ian, and right beneath them, very close, there is Keith Morrison. I could listen to that guy all night long, and truth is, most nights I do. Oh, that pesky DNA. I love that guy. Now, because I watch these shows, I know some things that you may not know. For example, I know that about a third of you were kidnapped at birth. You just don't know it yet. (laughs) And I know that about a third of you this past week met at Applebee's with an undercover cop that you thought was a hitman because you want to get rid of your spouse and collect the insurance money. I know your secrets. And... Also, I know that about a third of you have a dead body in your backyard buried underneath that newly poured concrete slab where you now have your barbecue pit. I know these things because I've watched these shows. (laughs) There's something else I know because I heard a detective say it in one of the episodes, and that is everybody has three lives, a public life, a private life, and a secret life. Public life, everybody knows about it. It's right out there for everybody to see. Private life is the life that, well, our family knows about, maybe a few close friends. And then there's our secret life, and that life no one knows about, at least not fully. Now, much that's in our secret life is really very positive. Our hopes, our dreams, our plans that we don't share with anyone because maybe we're a little shy or because we think we need to work on them a little more before we put them out there, or because we're kind of embarrassed to let anyone know that we dream this big. So much of our secret life, it's about something good and positive. This series that we're beginning today, not about any of those things. <laughs> this series called Out of the Shadows is looking at that part of our secret life that is kind of dark and maybe disturbing. That part of us that makes us wonder, is something wrong with me? I shouldn't think this way or feel this way, especially I'm a follower of Jesus. If I ever did, I should be over these things by now. Really what we're looking at is what we call our shadow self. And this series, Out of the Shadows, is a Lenten series, and we chose it for this time because we really believe that Lent is the perfect time to look at the darkness within us. It's the perfect time because Lent calls us to be rigorously honest about who we are and where we are and what's going on inside of us. It's the perfect time to look at that darkness and to be real about it because we know where Lent leads. It leads to the cross where Jesus died to pay for our sins. And on the other side of the cross, there is an empty tomb. And and that tomb now promises, God promises, that, that life and light and goodness can come out of darkness. So this is the perfect time to take the chance of looking at our shadow selves and being honest with it. Now, we're gonna look at things like doubt and depression and loneliness and repeated sin and shame. The message this morning is not about any particular aspect of our shadow self. It's more of an invitation. 
It's an invitation for you to enter the series and to drop your defenses and lower your guard and open your heart and to be honest about whatever we may find throughout this series. Really, this sermon is my giving you permission in the name of Jesus to be truly, fully, imperfectly, and maybe disturbingly human. And to trust that's okay. Because our God's grace is sufficient and his love is unfailing. So in this first message, our text is going to be the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, what I refer to as the story of us. Now, if you know the story, you know that God created a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, put them together in a garden paradise, and it could not have been better. Physically, all of their needs were provided for. Emotionally, relationally, it was incredible. The Bible says Adam and Eve were uh, naked and unashamed. It meant that they felt no need to hide or cover up. They could be transparent. They were glad to be seen by the other because they were so certain of each other's love. And best of all, they had a love relationship with God. God would walk with them and talk with them. God knew them. They knew God. It could not have been better. But all of that was broken when Adam and Eve did the one thing that God told them not to do. They ate from the one tree that he told them not to touch. And that's where we pick up in the story of us. Genesis 3. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now here's the first thing I want to tell you. You are not alone. If you discover that you have a shadow self and you do, You are not alone because we all do. There was a time in our story when there was no darkness within us. There was a time in our story where we had nothing to hide, nothing that we were fearful of that others might see, but that day was lost long ago in the garden. And ever since that day, to be human has meant to be a mass of contradictions. It means that we are regularly wrong, that we are often confused, that we find within our soul strong desires pulling us in two very different directions. We're pulled towards what is good and right, and we find something within our souls that pulls us to what is wrong and evil. And we find ourselves wanting to be known and yet feeling like we need to hide. We want to be seen for who we are, and yet we spend so much time protecting ourselves from the gaze of others, we find ourselves attracted to the light, and yet we find ourselves comforted by the shadows where we hide and no one sees us for who we are. Ever since this time, to be a human being has meant to be in this condition. Ever since this time, to be a human being has meant to be a mess. That's who you are. You're a mess. My definition of a human being is a wonderful mess. The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and you are are a wondrous creature, but you are also a mess. We all are. We may look very different on the outside, but on the inside, we are all strikingly similar. Those who work in the C-suite and those who work the line, celebrities and wannabes, saints and sinners, atheists and pastors. Whatever we may look like on the outside, on the inside, we are the same. We all have a shadow self. We all carry something. When we were young, many of us, and some of us later, something was done to us by someone that we trusted, something that wounded us, that harmed us, maybe that abused us, and somehow we've got in our minds that what was done to us by someone else is now our shame, and we carry that with us all the time. 
And we've done things that we know were wrong, that hurt others, and we have that guilt living in us, and often we can keep it down, but whenever it comes closer to the service, it tortures and it tries our souls. We find ourselves anxious and depressed when we have, no, we have no real reason to feel that way, and that makes us believe that we're defective and weak and something really is wrong with us. And we find that we love Jesus. <laughs> we really love Jesus. And we also find that at the very same time, we are proud and we are lustful and we are petty and we are mean and we hurt the people we love and we disappoint the God who loves us. And all of that would be bad enough, but then we usually do something to ourselves. We convince ourselves that the darkness in us is a special kind, a particular kind, a unique kind of darkness that no one else would really understand, that no one else really wrestles with. And so we've got to hide. We've got to protect that because if anyone ever saw that in us, they wouldn't want us, they wouldn't love us, they wouldn't respect us, they wouldn't stay with us. We tend to think that somehow our darkness is unique and we couldn't possibly let anyone else see it. You guys know who Tom Petty is, was? Two people know who Tom <laughs> Petty is? Okay. So uh, a few years ago, we got to go to one of his concerts. Of course, he's deceased now. It was a great, great, great night. And, you know, he's incredible songwriter, if you just look at his catalog of work, it's really rather uh, remarkable. And I love his songs, but there's one song, every time I hear it, I just, I sing along because I like it, but I just shake my head and I said, Tom, how could you possibly write that song? You know, part of the chorus goes like this, you don't know how it feels, you don't know how it feels to be me. You know how old Tom Petty was when he published that song? 44 years old. Sounds like a, a whiny 12-year-old, right? <laughs> you don't understand. You don't know what it's like. You just don't get it. You don't know how it feels to be me. Uh, Tom, I, I think I do know how it feels to be you. I think it feels just like being me. I think it feels just like being everyone in this room. We all know what it's like to think we're wonderful one minute and to think we're nothing the next minute. We all know what it's like to want to be a person that we ourselves can admire and respect and find ourselves giving into things that are beneath us and contemptible. We all know what it's like to have this struggle inside of ourselves, to feel like there's darkness in us and not know what to do with it. Look, Tom, I love you, brother, but you're not all that special. And friends, I love you but you're not all that special. Now, you're, you're special in the sense that God is crazy about you, crazy enough to send his son Jesus to die on the cross so you could be forgiven and enter into a love relationship with him that will last forever. Yeah, but special, like your darkness is somehow darker than ours? No. The fact that you have a shadow self, the fact that you wrestle with things that make you wonder if there's something wrong with you and you don't understand yourself and you're afraid that others will see you, having that shadow self does not make you different than the rest of us. It makes you one of us. That's where we all are, this wonderful mess. Now, I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse, but you're not alone. You're not different. Second thing I want to tell you is this. You can be honest. Whatever you discover is going on inside of you, the darkness, the shadows, you can be honest about that. At least you can be honest about that here at the loft. Because I truly believe that the loft is a good and safe place to look at your shadow self, bring it out into the light, and talk with somebody else about it. There are two forms of spirituality that churches tend to promote. And some don't even know what they're doing. It's just who they are. It's what they've been taught, and then they pass it on to others. And one form of spirituality is all about the outward appearance. And its way of operating is the ugliness and the darkness. It's really just deny and pretend 
and play a role. So don't ask real questions, just accept our answers, just conform. And when you struggle, don't admit it, not really. And when you struggle and you've prayed about it and nothing changes, and when you've read the Bible and done what the Bible says and nothing changes, and when you've cried out to God and you've told him that you're broken and you're hurting and you need something and it doesn't come through, not quickly, not the way you want it, and you still struggle and you feel terrible about yourself, don't say anything. Hide it, cover it up, deny it, pretend that everything's going fine. Because if you talk about it, you're going to make God look bad. You're going to make Jesus look bad. You're going to make you look bad. And we will all just feel much better about ourselves and about our faith if we just don't talk about those ugly, disturbing things that we find inside and that don't go away quickly. Now, if you grew up in a church like that, I'm sorry. Someone in the name of Jesus wounded you and misled you about what spirituality is. We're not one of those churches. We believe that real spirituality is being real with God and with others about who we are, where we are, and what's going on inside us, whether it's beautiful or whether it's ugly, whether it's admirable or whether it's deplorable. Because we believe spirituality is about being honest about who we are and bringing that to God. So here at the Loft, we don't really applaud people who have all the right answers about God. We admire people who are willing to talk about what's wrong with them. We're not impressed with people who seem to have it all together. We're impressed with people who will open up and share their secrets and talk about their struggles. I can't tell you how many times in the course of my ministry someone has come to tell me something that they find shameful in themselves. And I can usually tell that's where the conversation is going to go before they get there because um, it takes them a while and they look very nervous, and then they share something that they've done or that they continue to do or something that's been done to them. And before our conversation is over, I always say to them, listen, I want you to know that I understand that what you've done here today took great courage. I know it was hard to pick up the phone. I know it was hard to drive here. I know it was hard to sit here, and I know it was hard to share what you've shared. And the next time I see you, I don't want you to be worried about what I know about you or what I think about you because what you have shared with me does not make me think less of you. It makes me think more of you. It makes me think that you really want to honor God with your life. You really want to get things right. You really want to be the kind of person that can be faithful to others in your life. And I think that's who we are here at the loft. And when people share these secrets, these shameful things, the darkness in their life, we treat that for what it is, something that is sacred and holy, a trust that's been given to us, something that we must protect and care for. Let's go back to the story of Adam and Eve. So God comes and he says, hey, have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat from? And are they honest with God? Well, yes and no, which means no, right? Yes and no. (laughs) When it comes to being honest, means no. So uh, as Adam, have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat from? Well, yeah, but only because the woman gave it to me. See, the darkness is not in me, God. The darkness is in her. Deal with the darkness in her. Eve? Have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat from? Well, yes, but only because the serpent deceived me. The darkness is not in me. The darkness is in there. Deal with the darkness in the serpent, not in me. I've wondered what would have happened if Adam and Eve had been honest. They didn't deflect. They didn't deny. They didn't play games. What if they said, yes, God? We ate from the tree, and we are guilty, and we are ashamed, and though we do not deserve it, we ask for forgiveness, 
We ask for mercy. We ask you to come and take this darkness out of our souls. I wonder what twist the story would have taken, where it might have ended. We'll never know. What we do know is where it did end. It ended with Adam and Eve being disconnected from each other. Instead of being naked and unashamed, begin to wear clothes and, and hide and protect themselves. And they became disconnected from God. They ended up outside of the garden. And that is no surprise because that's always what bad religion does to people. That's always what dishonesty does. It separates us from others. It separates us from God. It disconnects us from our true self. You can be honest here at the loft because we admit we all have this darkness, this shadow self. And what we admire and respect is not having it all together, but being real and honest. That leads to the third thing I want to tell you. Not only can you be honest, you must be honest. There's a saying in the recovery community. It goes, uh, we are a sick as our secrets. And what that means is that until you name your secrets, they name you. Until you speak them out loud, they will speak over your life. Until you reveal your secrets to somebody else, they have power over you. It's only when you bring them out into the light, bring them to someone, confess them, it's only then, by God's grace, you begin to have power over them. Until you name your secrets, your secrets will name you. And the name your secrets give you, those names are unworthy, unwanted, undeserving, unlovable, shameful. These are the names that hide in the shadows. These are the names that the darkness whispers into our souls. If you want to escape its power, you must speak it out. You must name it and bring it into the light. Let's go back to our story again. Genesis 3, 9, and 10. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So what does God ask Adam? Where are you? Why does God ask Adam, where are you? Because God really couldn't find Adam. Adam was really good at playing hide-and-go-seek, and God was just stumped and had no idea. And so God kind of says, Ali, Ali, and free, game over. Adam, jump out and surprise me. Man, are you good at this? No. <laughs> God knew exactly where Adam was. So why did he ask Adam, where are you? Because he wanted Adam to name the place where he was. God, I'm in a place called shame. God, I'm in a place called broken. God, I'm in a place called sin. God, I am in a place called hopeless. God, I'm in a place called need. God wanted Adam to name the place where he was, to be honest with him. See, God can work with people who are honest, even if the answer is not a good answer. But what God can't do is do a work in the life of someone who is dishonest and will not be real. You must be honest because real growth requires being real. Real transformation requires real honesty, bringing to God who you are. You, you may have heard me say this. You cannot give to God what you do not have. And until you have what this secret is, what this darkness is, until you name it, until you embrace it, not, not in the sense you, you grab onto it like it's a treasure and you won't let go of it, but in the sense that you no longer deny it, you no longer hide from it, you no longer pretend that it's not there. Only when you pick it up and you embrace it and say, God, I hate it, but this is part of me right now. I have it. Only then can you give it to God and he can take it away from you. I came across this statement this um, past week. I don't know who said it. it's not original with me, so I can't attribute it to anyone, but I love it. It says, 
Jesus cannot transform the person you are pretending to be. Jesus can't transform pretend people because they don't exist. He can only transform people who are real. And to be real, you've got to be real. You've got to put it out there. I wonder what would happen if you could find a place, you could find a people, a community, where you felt so safe, so secure, so loved, that you could look into the darkness and bring it out and name it and put it there for others to see? I, I know the answer. You would immediately feel a great burden lifted off your shoulders. You would be able to relax and breathe in God's good air. You would have a growing sense of peace. You would have a growing sense of joy. You would discover that there is hope and grace for people like you. And you would begin a path that would lead you to restoration and redemption and you would be able to hear your true name. Wanted, worthy, loved, child of God. You can be honest about the darkness. You must be honest because that's how real growth occurs. Here's the last thing that I would tell you. And that is you can trust God's grace. Whatever you've done, God has forgiven it before. Whoever you have become, God has loved that before. Whatever was done to you, God has healed that before. And wherever you have wandered, God has gone there before, and he will go there again to find you. Back to the story, Genesis 3.8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So Adam and Eve have sinned. They have broken God's law. Really, they have broken God's heart. They are hiding from God. And what? He comes looking for them. Their guilt, their shame, the wrong that they did, did not keep God from wanting to find them, wanting to reach out to them. He doesn't wait for them to go looking for him. He goes and looks. And I can tell you that whatever you've done, however you failed, Whatever thing it is that makes you feel guilty and ashamed of yourself, it does not keep God from finding you, reaching out to you, and wanting you to come back to him. Now, there are consequences. Adam and Eve were put outside of the garden. God says, we're going to have to do some things to restore this relationship. So there's going to be a barrier between us for a while. So he removes them from the garden, but listen, not without a promise. What a promise it is. Look with me, God speaking to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, this is the very first messianic prophecy that we have in the Bible. We're three chapters in and already God is promising that one will come. Now, what this doesn't say is that I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, plural, and hers. It's singular. So what God's not saying here is like, look, most sons and daughters of Eve aren't going to like snakes and snakes aren't going to like them. That's not what's going on here. He says, your offspring singular, one is going to come. And he tells the serpent, you will strike his heel, your venom and your fangs, the venom and the fangs of evil will strike into his body exactly what happened on the cross as he took our sin, our darkness, our evil into himself. But he will crush your head. He will destroy your power. He will overcome what you have done. And he will restore my people back to myself. That's the promise that God gives you and me. Whatever darkness has come upon us, whatever we've given ourselves to or whatever has been done to us, one has come who can crush the power of evil and who can restore us back to God. Almost done. I want to look with you at a passage from uh, Brennan Manning. 
He writes, Jesus spent a disproportionate amount of time with people described in the Gospels as the poor, the blind, the lame, the lepers, sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, those possessed by unclean spirits. One of the mysteries of the gospel is the strange attraction of Jesus for the unattractive, the strange desire for the undesirable, the strange love for the unlovely. The key to this mystery is he loves those whom the Father loves. Who is Jesus attracted to? Those who have darkness in their souls. (laughs) Sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, those possessed by unclean spirits. Jesus was attracted to them. He went looking for them. He found them in their darkness and in their lostness and in their shame. And they felt such love from him that they were honest about their lives and they opened their lives to him. And they discovered that his grace was sufficient. You know who did not respond to Jesus? Primarily a group that we called the Pharisees who are all about the rules and the uh, regulations, the outward appearance of religion. And what did Jesus call them? Hypocrites. Very interesting word. Greek word hypocrites, it means actor. People who acted in Greek plays were called hypocrites because the word literally means to speak from under. Actors in Greek plays, they wore masks. They spoke from under a mask. No one knew who they really were. They played the part of someone else. And Jesus says, when you believe that religion and spirituality is about the outward appearance and doing everything right, and you will not get real about what lives inside of you, and you will not bring what's real inside of you, even the ugly parts, out into the light, into God's grace, you are a actor, you are playing a part, you're not being real, and God's grace will never be able to transform your life. So, you're not alone. You can be honest about your shadow self. You must be honest for your life to be transformed. And we can do that because God's grace is real. God's grace is sufficient, and he has promised that if we are honest with him, his spirit will go to work, and what Jesus has accomplished will bring transformation into our lives. And I pray this series will give you an opportunity and give me an opportunity to do just that. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are grateful that we don't have to hide. We're grateful for a community that understands that Real spirituality means being real, that we don't need to pretend, that we shouldn't pretend, that all we need to do is be honest and bring our true selves to you, and that you, by your grace, will do the work that's required to make us new and transformed and whole. So I pray, Father, that you would all give us the grace as we walk through this series together to look at ourselves and be honest. Lord, Give us the grace to speak to others about where we are because it's then that we find that there truly is love for us. There truly is hope for us. There truly is a way out of the darkness. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.